The iPod Touch 5th generation released in late 2012 and as of right now was the final major update to the iPod Touch line, despite there being two generations made afterwards in 2015 and 2019. The iPod 5 might look the same as newer iPod Touches, but trying to use it tells a completely different story. On iOS 9 it struggles, feeling about as slow as can be and giving a frustrating experience even for menial tasks like, say, music. It is an iPod after all, and a very important iPod at that, one that's extremely significant to Apple's history, even if they'd rather you forget about it. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and today we're taking a look at the fifth generation iPod Touch. What made this device so special, and how does it hold up nearly a decade later? Nearly a decade later, it's hard to believe, but time flies when you're ignoring the iPod Touch line. At least that seems to have been Apple's mantra as of recent, with only minor technical bumps in the two newer generations over the five, something that the device drastically needed, in all fairness. But the changes have avoided the most pressing issue, the battery life. This iPod is unbelievably thin and light, as is the 6th gen and the 7, but because of this, the battery is extremely small and has a really tough time holding a charge. While it might perform somewhat okay brand new, give it a year or two, and as the battery degrades, so will the user experience exponentially. That being said, the iPod Touch 5 might be the only device of these three that can be forgiven for this clear oversight, given that it launched with iOS 6, an iteration of software that wasn't particularly power hungry, as well as the fact that the form factor was honestly pretty innovative. An iOS device this small, thin, and light hasn't been done by Apple since beyond other iPod Touches, and it really makes sense for what you might expect to be the core functionality, music. It is an iPod, and the small size lends itself greatly to the ease of bringing it around, whether on a jog, or working out, or hooked up in your car to your audio system, or wherever and whenever you might find yourself. If there's somewhere you want to go and you don't want to risk bringing your phone along, the iPod Touch might be the perfect device for that. It's not particularly durable or water resistant, but it does have a headphone jack, something you'd likely want on any music player, and when it comes to AirPods, it does lack official support, but you can connect it through regular Bluetooth settings instead of the typical easy immediate pop-up to set things up, so it's a little more annoying but very doable. If you use AirPods though, an Apple Watch, maybe with cellular, could be a good idea to stream music, and really I wouldn't recommend using the iPod Touch 5 especially as a music player anyways. How many people even still use downloaded music? Of course I'm sure some of you do whenever I say there's not a lot of people who have or do something, I get about a million comments telling me the opposite, but you know what I mean, most people stream music now nowadays from Apple Music or Spotify, versus those who still have a large library through iTunes and buy and download songs. But if that's you, you could of course get an iPod and download that audio to the iPod. It's more convenient than, you know, wasting space on your phone. If you do want to buy an iPod, the 7th generation will only cost you about 200 bucks from Apple's website, and that's not bad. It's definitely worth going for over something like this, as even for just music, the iPod 5 is super slow, and the battery life in any of these devices but especially if it's used, will be quite painful. If you already have an iPod lying around, that's one thing, but definitely don't go trying to buy an iPod 5 or 6. As it stands, the iPod Touch 5 is technically functional, but essentially obsolete, at least by the general standards of most users nine years later. Something that shouldn't be much of a surprise, but it's worth talking about all the same. The only thing that keeps this iPod from being completely forgotten is that it looks identical to the newest 2019 iPod Touch 7, as well as the software that is slow as it is, is only out of date as of late 2016, which I guess is half a decade ago already, but it's recent enough that most apps are functional even if you're needing to download the latest compatible version. Heck, the newest version of TikTok will run on here for some reason as it requires iOS 9.3 or better, so the iPod Touch 5 is actually basically the ultimate dedicated TikTok machine. That's a use case for someone out there, right? I wanted to take a little time to talk about the music aspect of the iPod 5, as well as the fact that, you know, it is really old, and so you shouldn't expect much from it going into this video, and I'm sure you didn't. But with that out of the way, why don't we back up here and start where the iPod Touch 5 really managed to set itself apart from its older brothers, that amazingly compact design. Released just weeks after the iPhone 5, it's no wonder the iPod Touch 5th generation has a design fairly similar, though it was quite different for an iPod. Steve Jobs had passed the year prior, and it had left Apple with a lot of freedom in which direction they wanted to move forward. Result 
resulting in a lot of experimentation as seen best in the 2013 iPhone 5C. But in 2012, they did make the move to the rectangular, slightly larger aluminum body of the iPhone 5 from the 4S, and they would do the same with the iPod Touch, which would end up being a very appreciated move. It was actually quite the selling point for the iPod, as the 4-inch display might seem kind of small now, but was something that was a really big deal to Apple fans in 2012, up from the 3.5 inches of the past, and that iPod 5 would have been the cheapest and easiest way to get your hands on it. And man alive is this iPod ever slim. It's crazy. The use cases for iPod touches were getting more and more niche since the fourth generation, as they've gotten to the point of being basically just iPhones without a SIM tray thanks to the addition of the camera. But Apple wanted to lean into this, emphasizing the camera quality and compact nature of the device as major selling points. There's even a small circle here on the back that pops up to let you attach a wristband, similar to what you would have on a digital camera for some extra safety when taking photos. It was an interesting idea, but one in practice that didn't really get used a whole lot as people tended not to even know about it. As such, the 2015 iPod 6 would remove it altogether, making for the only distinguishing change besides the color palette. And the colors! That was something all new for the iPod Touch line. The only color other than black seen previously was the white model iPod Touch 4, and it only changed the color of the screen bezels, so to have genuine options in black, silver, pink, yellow, and blue might seem arbitrary now, but was honestly super appealing in 2012. There was also the more limited product red color like we have today, where part of the profits go to charity. That's been on the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th generation iPod. And all these new colors made a lot of sense for those who weren't quite ready for a smartphone, especially because a large portion of those people would be children. The iPod 5 also saw some unique variations of models, so I'll run through those very briefly. It's somewhat interesting, but it is mostly unimportant to what most remember as the main iPod itself. So for one thing, you had the black iPod Touch 5, specifically called Black in Slate, a color that would be done away with on the iPod Touch, as well as the first generation iPad mini. This all happening in 2013 as the iPhone 5 was discontinued and the 5S was launched. And we got instead Space Gray, which is a gray on the back instead of black, but retaining the black bezels. I do miss the slate in black, I really liked it, but it did have the tendency to chip and scratch very easily, which is why Apple did away with it. So if you ever see a black and slate iPad mini or iPod Touch 5th generation, you'll know it was one of the original models sold between 2012 and 2013. And there was also the lesser iPod Touch 5th generation that would have 16 gigabytes and was there to attract maybe the more typical iPod audience as well as those who just wanted a cheaper device. It had no camera on the back and came in only one color, silver, with black bezels. It did retain the front-facing camera, something that I always found a little confusing as personally I would prefer to have the back camera, but I suppose it made sense he could still use FaceTime and things like that. I don't know why Apple didn't just re-release the regular iPod 5 with all its colors and 16 gigabytes. This one seems kind of out of place in their lineup, and Apple must have agreed as it entered the May of 2013 and was discontinued quietly the June of 2014. It was then that they would make a regular 16 gigabyte iPod Touch 5th generation. And I think when anyone talks about the iPod Touch 5, they typically are looking at the normal models, of which I of course have here in uh, Space Gray. It's nothing special. I actually have two of these, uh, one I got from my uncle years ago, and one I got a few months ago from a, from a different aunt. It's not exactly too exciting, but it's functional, and not everyone can have a blue one like my friend did back in the day. On screen here, you can see some footage I took a few years back on my iPhone. I guess this was maybe 2016. Oh man, I don't know how my quality has gotten so much worse since then. I do want to talk about the camera because it was a really big focus of this iPod, but before we do, let's just finish up here with the design. On the bottom of the device is the lightning port, which was new for the time, changing from the 30 pin of old and being a much better and much more futuristic choice, given that we're still using it today. The headphone jack is also there, just like it is on the latest 7th generation iPod Touch, that iPod 7 being one of the final iOS devices to still come with a headphone jack. The 4-inch retina display was one of the best selling points of the iPod in 2012, and it still holds up fantastically today. Having that classic resolution of 1136 by 640 that was on so many Apple devices, and pixel density of 326 pixels per inch. This was actually one of the best displays on the market in 2012, with only some higher-end Androids properly even competing with Apple's Retina display at the time. And again, this was bigger than literally any iPhone ever made besides the iPhone 5. So for anyone who would get their hands on one of these, it was absolutely awesome. The old home button under the screen was made before Touch ID, so if you want any level of security, you'll be putting in your passcode way too frequently. Funnily enough, the 2019 iPod Touch also doesn't have Touch ID. Not as much of an excuse for that, um, but it is the 
final iOS device to actually have the old home button, which is kind of interesting. This device is so darn small. It looks so tiny, and yet it was one of the biggest iOS devices Apple had ever made besides iPad back in 2012. At least the screen size was one of the biggest. It was so thin, so light, and that actually really hurts the device. One of the most important aspects of any smartphone or iPod or anything similar is battery life, and the iPod Touch 5th generation really sucks here. It has a tiny battery, and as such, horrible battery life. In the beginning on iOS 6, I'm sure it probably sufficed, but after a number of years being used, and as the battery naturally degrades, at this point you'd be very lucky to get multiple hours out of it before needing to look for the nearest outlet. This is the same darn problem on the iPod 6 and 7, and it's a real pity Apple refuses to do anything about it in spite of it being such a simple fix. Make the iPod a bit thicker for more battery life, it's not rocket science. And it's so small, it's not like it would make it too bulky, not even close. On the iPod 5, it's fairly excusable because of the age and because it came with iOS 6, but it's definitely not on the iPod 6 or iPod 7. Okay, let's take a look at the 5 megapixel iSight camera on the rear, something Apple really wanted to sell you on when the device came out, as it more or less produces similar quality photos to the iPhone 4, making for a huge upgrade from the VGA quality of the previous generation. Looking at photos taken on it today is, well, it's interesting, but there's no question this quality just isn't very good. Even in 2012, being significantly lesser than most smartphones with only those 5 megapixels. But for a budget device made for mainly kids almost 10 years ago, I can only complain so much, and I would argue that the ability to at least take pictures is more important than the quality of said pictures in a device of this age, especially for those who used it back in the day. Video can be filmed in 1080p, believe it or not, this sure doesn't look 1080p as we might think of it now, but in terms of resolution size it is indeed 1920 by 1080 video. Full HD on an iPod of this size was a selling point in and of itself, even if it seems silly nowadays. The front-facing camera is a somewhat decent 1.2 megapixels, a number Apple would use in many devices released in the years after this iPod, and honestly given the age, I have to say this is a decent enough selfie. It might not be, I don't know, good, or even not bad, but it's more than good enough for a device like the iPod Touch 5. The camera did the job, and that's what this all comes down to. While the wrist strap wasn't particularly used, as it really wasn't necessary, the iPod Touch 5 was still great for photography in the years it was relevant. Even in 2015 when the iPod 6 came out, well, sure, it was definitely behind the times, it would still take pictures in 8 megapixels on that one, and capturing moments and memories is all you can ask of any device like this in the end. In 2015 when the iPod 6 came out, all it really changed was the technical specifications, and while it was disappointing there wasn't anything else, it was a very much needed improvement. With iOS 9, and even as early as iOS 7, with the update that redesigned the entire core experience of iOS, the iPod 5 was getting really slow, really fast. Here we have the Apple A5 chipset and half a gigabyte of RAM. On paper, specs that seemed good when it came out in 2012 as it matched the only year-old iPhone 4S, and that CPU was dual-core, which was great for a budget device, but little did everyone know just how badly these specs would end up holding it back in the years to come. Using this iPod now, even for the most basics of basics with iOS 9, it's brutal. So slow, so obsolete, so painful, just brutal. And it might not look that bad. It might just look a little slow, but completely livable. Keep in mind, this iPod here has very little on it. I restored it recently, right, for this video. Imagine an iPod that's almost full for space, maybe 16 gigs, and you have tons of apps and you're actually trying to do genuine things on it. This is like opening up the calendar is not an intensive task, or the music app, or anything like this, and it shouldn't take this long, even if it's only delaying me a couple seconds. The problem is, is you extrapolate this over a long period of time, and it really, really will frustrate you. That being said, on iOS 9, there are benefits to the iPod having gotten too many updates. Namely, there are more recent versions of apps that can still be used. Some can't be used at all, such as Disney Plus for whatever reason, as it was never released on iOS 9 devices, but then weirdly enough, as said, TikTok can be fully used with the latest versions. So it varies app to app, and for the majority of them, you'll be downloading the latest compatible version, assuming you've had it on your Apple ID account before. And even then, there's no guarantee the app will run properly, as perhaps services have been discontinued, formats have changed, or it could just be slow. It's that half gigabyte of RAM that really holds the iPod back, as well as a relatively underpowered CPU. And that iOS 9 update from 2015, and even the 2014 iOS 8 update, they were just too power hungry for any device that used the A5 chipset. iOS 9 especially resulted in a whole skew of devices instantly made obsolete. And while I always do get comments swearing up and down that iOS 9 isn't as bad as I make it out to be, yeah, I do get those comments. Listen, a couple years back, I lived for a week on the 
iPhone 4S, and that was with iOS 8. Trust me, that was slow enough, and I've been reviewing these devices for long enough to know just how bad they can be. If you're still using an iPod 5 or an iPhone 4S or any of these devices, I feel for you. If it's working for you, that's as always great. I mean, sure, use old devices to their fullest. It makes practical sense, right? But at the same time, these devices are quite out of date. They're very old. I mean, this iPod's almost 10 years old, so yeah, I'm gonna recommend you get something better, whether it be the iPod 7, which I don't really recommend because of the battery life, or say the iPhone 10R. But I digress, and while performance is rough, it isn't fully fair to judge the iPod Touch 5 purely off of that. After all, even if iOS 9 had run half decently, the device would still be very old, and so it can't be expected to hold up too kindly. In fact, it being able to run as much as it can, as is, is honestly very impressive. If you are in the camp of having an old iPod Touch of 5th uh, generation, 6th generation, whichever, and you're not really using it much, something you could try with it if you'd like is jailbreaking. There's lots of stuff you can do with these older devices. Personally, I find it all a lot of fun, and you know, you can just mess around with it a bit. But I wanted to mention jailbreaking because honestly, it's probably one of the most common uses with older Apple devices. But jailbreaking aside, I wouldn't want to use the iPod Touch 5 for anything nowadays, but I could see it working as a music player if need be, especially assuming you have a big iTunes library or something to that extent. And beyond that, you know, it would work as maybe a device for a kid to play some basic games or be able to use iMessage on Wi-Fi. But that's about it. And for most of us, the iPod Touch 5 will remain simply a nostalgic piece of Apple's history and symbolic of the turn of an era as the last iPod to properly get a true upgrade over its predecessor. I hope that won't be the case forever, but I fear that it's very likely that it will be. This might just be the last flagship iPod as we used to remember them. And it makes sense given that it's just a phone, really, just without a SIM tray, but it's still kind of sad. And I'm glad that we got to take a look at the iPod Touch 5 today. Did any of you have it back in the day? How'd it work for you? I remember being very jealous of a couple friends who had it, that uh, blue one that my friend had. He used that up until high school, actually. He was using it in 2016 when I filmed it. It might have been late 2016, early 2017. It was around there he was still using it, and he eventually got an SE, but that thing was brutal even then, and it wasn't even that behind in iOS updates yet. But yeah, if you had one, make sure you let me know in the comments below, especially if you're still somehow using it. I, I gotta know how that's going for you, even if it's just for music or the like. If you found this video interesting, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore tech if you'd like to, for some reason. And we do have a Discord, as always, link in the description. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.